All right, our next speaker uh, is the distinguished clinical professor of space leadership, business and policy at the Wonder, uh, Thunderbird School of Global Management at Arizona State University. Uh, he also serves as the chair of the safety working group of ComStack, which is the Commercial Space Transportation Advisory Committee. Dr. Greg Autry, pleased to see you, sir. Thank you so much, Susan. Uh, thank you, everybody at the Mars Society for uh, uh, taking the opportunity to allow me to speak. Uh, thank you in particular to uh, Bob Zubrin, who I greatly admire for including a number of different voices uh, in his fine conferences. And uh, I hope to see you all soon in person at the next one. Um, you know, I was going to uh, talk about one thing and, and some events have occurred that uh, have shifted a little bit what I, I intend to talk about. Um, Okay, so uh, I was going to talk about just space entrepreneurship, um, but I really want to talk about space entrepreneurship uh, under attack and uh, make a little bit of a call to action in support of uh, something that I assume most of us here at the uh, conference are, are excited about seeing and supporting. Um, I'd like to say it's the best of times and it's the worst of times. This is the year that a lot of us have been waiting for for a very, very, very long time. Uh, you know, we just we just friggin' watched uh, Captain Kirk go to space uh, and and watch the uh, the overview effect click, and we've been sitting around uh, many of us for a very very long time um, waiting for uh, for this day. And it wasn't just uh, the Blue Origin flight. Of course, it was the uh, Richard Branson Virgin flight uh, this summer, one I've been waiting for for a while. Uh, it was the Inspiration Four flight from SpaceX, and uh, we know that a lot more is coming. We're, we're going to see human spaceflight from uh, uh, Boeing. Hopefully uh, next year, we're going to uh, see uh, the Orion capsule, uh, hopefully uh, carrying people in a couple of years. Uh, Starship, my gosh, uh, that will, will change the world. Uh, it's a great time to be here. Uh, I've been studying this for a long time. Um, I was on the runway back in 2004 when uh, Spaceship One made the first human Space flight and watched Richard Branson uh, announce that he was going to uh, to form a space tourism company. Uh, the first, I think, really serious uh, attempt at that. Um, there were quite a few efforts in the past, but the, the first time that somebody of real credibility stepped up and committed their credibility to uh, to making it happen. And uh, you know, bless him, he did. Uh, it's been 17 years. If you would have asked me uh, back in 2004 when I took this photo. Uh, when that was going to happen, <laughs> I and the folks in the crowd would have said, oh, it's going to be about three years. And then about five years, you know, we're all going to be flying. Uh, it's uh, 17 years later, uh, but here we are. So that's exciting. Uh, I go to Google uh, an image of William Shatner and uh, the Blue Origin capsule for this speech. And this is what I find. The top story on CNN about space is this quote from Prince William. We need some of the world's greatest brains and minds fixed on trying to repair this planet, not trying to find the next place to go and live. Um, that's extremely disappointing to me. Uh, I've been disappointed in his brother for a while. Uh, now, unfortunately, I, I'm disappointed in the, the prince. And, you know, I have to describe myself, frankly, as an Anglophile. Uh, and uh, like a number of Americans, I'm even kind of a fan of the British royal family, uh, a peculiar American trait. And yet, um, you look at all the great things that are happening in, uh, in the UK in space. I had the opportunity uh, uh, to spend a little more than a, a week uh, in the UK uh, about three weeks ago. I was in London, and I had the opportunity to speak uh, uh, at Oxford and meet some good friends at Imperial College uh, and speak to a group of Thunderbird uh, alumni, uh, sit on a Doctor of Philosophy uh, candidate's uh, um, Viva for uh, his cybersecurity uh, uh, and satellites paper. Um, there's a lot of great things happening in the space uh, world in the UK. And you look at these stories, you would think that the leadership of the UK would be uh, wholeheartedly embracing this. And, and the PM is, and a lot of people in Parliament get this. But to come back uh, from seeing the opportunities for jobs and economic growth and uh, improving the life of everybody on Earth, uh, improving the, the quality of the planet, learning more about our planet and making everybody aware of it and, and, and have this quote show up uh, was devastating. So I, I wanna talk about this because 
we can't just talk about space entrepreneurship and numbers and say, this is what's happening with satellite launches. And this is the number of new rocket companies that are appearing. And is there going to be a, a shakeout and, uh, you know, who's going to build things in space? Uh, that's all good, but we can't do any of that uh, if we are stopped uh, dead in our tracks uh, by misguided political thinking. And this, this is entirely representative of this. And sadly, this isn't the only source of this. Uh, so this has been going on uh, for a while. There's always been the problems right here on Earth crowd. Um, and yet here uh, we find that there's a, a new level of, of what I have to say is, is hysteria directed at space. It's not just, yeah, we've got these problems on Earth and we want to solve them. It's like we want to stop you from doing what you're doing because we're so tied up in, the, in managing our current disaster that we don't want anything else going on. Um, and uh, that's truly disturbing, particularly when it's applied to space, which you all know, we'll talk more about it. Uh, Bernie Sanders, same take there, right? So there's definitely a group of folks on the progressive side of the aisle who have misplaced their environmental priorities, thinking that somehow uh, the development, exploration, and, uh, and commercial activity in space is going to be a threat rather than, than a boon to planet Earth. And uh, Unfortunately, they're only willing to see one side. The media rewards that message because it's exciting and they'll keep pumping it out there. Uh, of course, there's no monopoly on stupid. The Wall Street Journal uh, uh, has uh, published an article against space tourism too. So you've got folks on the right who it, uh, uh, would like to take down what we're trying to, to all achieve uh, is a better opportunity for humanity. There is a broad concern. Uh, and some of it with some scientific basis about the impact of uh, spaceflight uh, on the atmosphere and, and on, on Earth's uh, uh, fragile biosphere. And, and we should, of course, always be serious about any new uh, system that we add to, uh, to our biosphere uh, and evaluate it. That said, um, what you see in the headlines is insanely out of proportion. We're talking about right now uh, dozens of space flights per year. Uh, we might get to hundreds of space flights per year soon. I'd love to see thousands of space flights per year, but there are about 14 million uh, FAA uh, um, uh, tracked airplane flights going on every year. There are like 45,000 a day. Uh, we will never get to that point, and the impact that space will have on that is, is small. I won't go into the, the technical details. There's certainly choices we can make on propellants and, and other things to make sure that we're as considerate as possible, but it is an issue being blown out of control, and the question is, is why is that? Um, and it's because it will play political dividends. Uh, if you can go attack Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, and, and Richard Branson, you're going to get press for your political agenda. Uh, and uh, so you'll just add that to the, the, the list of, uh, of enemies that, uh, that you need to, uh, to go after. And this is a serious, serious problem. Do not dismiss this as, oh, they just don't get it. And this is going to go away. Um, we have been here before. And I know this is something that Bob Zubrin is, is very familiar with. In 70 years of, of nuclear power in the United States, nobody has ever been killed by a nuclear power plant. Um, hundreds of people are killed directly by fossil fuel power uh, every year. People are occasionally killed by one, wind turbine accidents, but nobody's ever, ever, ever been killed by nuclear power. Uh, in fact, probably we're killing hundreds of thousands of Americans every year with a secondary impact of fossil fuels from uh, particulate emissions and hydrocarbon emissions. And yet we lost the nuclear power industry, a very mature and uh, profitable and, uh, and up and coming industry in, in the 1960s uh, that became the uh, cause du jour for post Vietnam protesters. It was though the civil rights and Vietnam protesters now needed something else to go attack and they went and they attacked this technological industry. It was easy to attack because people did not understand it. Uh, anytime you've got a technology that the general public is not capable of, uh, of understanding, they're going to go after it. And in fact, so they have. Um, and when they went after nuclear, they won. If you look at that chart on the left, you can see the electricity generating capacity from nuclear dropping and the number of new uh, nuclear reactors that are going to be licensed is, is down to zero, while the number of retirements is huge. If we 
go forward and look at this, you'll see the red lines down at the bottom in the 1970s through 90s. These were the reactors that were planned and permitted in the 60s and, uh, and 70s uh, and early 80s, uh, but then finally got built through the 90s, but basically none zero after that. There's been a huge cost to that. Uh, there's been a huge economic cost because nuclear would have provided much cheaper and reliable power to us. There's a huger cost coming up because frankly, uh, the Green New Deal and the argument that solar is going to power the world is, is a fraud. Uh, nighttime is a thing. Uh, winter is in fact a thing and in the high latitude skies are covered with clouds for weeks at a time and the snow in your solar panels are, 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 uh, are obliterated and this will not solve uh, the climate change problem. Nuclear is the only practical way to do that and it is not in our quiver because that industry was taken out uh, by a group of politically uh, minded activists who needed a new target to hit and they are very, very similar to the folks that are coming after space. So do not doubt uh, that if we don't find an organized response to this that uh, we could in fact find our entire industry uh, shut down. So now that I've scared you, I hope, uh, what, what to do? Uh, well, first of all, we're winning right now. Uh, space is hot. The public in general loves it. There are uh, a lot of folks in the media trying to, to turn them uh, into being opposed to it, but by their very nature, uh, most Americans and most people in the world love exploration and, and daring do and uh, uh, seeing uh, uh, new technologies arrive that promise to make their world more interesting. So the first thing is, is let's not screw up, right? Uh, I beg you to consider stopping the infighting in the space community, all right? And this is all of us. Uh, be rational and, and not emotional. And I'm not going to get into the specifics, but you know there are people there who want only company X to succeed or only company Y to succeed. Uh, they want to shut down other people's programs. Uh, they want to see governmental agencies not able to continue doing what they plan to do for years because they perceive there's only one uh, true religion within in their space technology domain and they know how to do this. And that, that's great. Please play up your solution and why it's the best, but be really careful about attacking the other people in the space community because we need to be united towards the external threat, which is a much more serious issue than the misallocation of capital within the space domain. Uh, stop scoring points off those, those other guys. Uh, seriously consider rolling back the tweets where you're attacking somebody else in, instead of promoting yourself. Uh, consider uh, when you make a speech that it's not necessary to try to cancel a government program Z uh, uh, under the misguided belief that you're gonna get that money because guess what? This is not a zero sum game. Uh, this is something that when I was on the NASA transition team, I spent a lot of time arguing about, which is, you know, let's not argue about whether I want to kill your big government program or you want to stop uh, some commercial program that might be coming from the left coast. Let's instead agree on getting the pie bigger and, and do more in space than we have ever before. Dollars from canceled NASA programs, for instance, do not go to the space project that you love. Uh, Administrator Senator Nelson is not sitting there waiting uh, for uh, a couple of billion dollars to be freed up from somewhere so he can take it and put it in another pot and do the thing that you love. Uh, in fact, the Congress of the United States appropriates each of these programs. And guess what? The folks in the OMB uh, slowly dole that money out to the agency. The NASA administrator can't move more than about $500,000 around and you can't move you know, buy a condo in DC for $500,000. You kill a program you don't like, most likely Congress is gonna take that money and go fund something completely different that they're concerned about today and will get them votes in their district and it will not be space. So it's under, important to understand that even if you think this money is not perfectly well allocated, okay, it's going to a program that is not the technically most efficient thing according to the latest book you read from somebody that you really respect, Guess what? It's creating infrastructure, it's funding education, it is making all of space possible. And when some company fails because their system isn't, uh, isn't that efficient or some program the government runs eventually gets shut down, those people who were trained and educated do not evaporate. Those facilities that were built are redeployed. That machining equipment goes on the market and is purchased for cheap by more aggressive entrepreneurial and functional companies. It's okay. Very, very little of that money goes to waste. 
So I want you to go out there and talk about space everywhere you go. Uh, I am going to segue real quick um, to a, uh, a video that I would like to share. Uh, this is 45 seconds of my, my Senate testimony, something that I was very proud of putting together into uh, to one place. Why spend money in space when we have problems here on Earth? During Apollo, our nation was engaged in an intractable Cold War, a bloody ground conflict in Vietnam. There were bitter disagreements at home over the draft, civil rights, racial injustice, women's equality. Several beloved American leaders were assassinated. Protests roiled our campuses. Riots rocked our cities. The Hong Kong flu pandemic killed nearly 100,000 Americans in 1969. Among that chaos, NASA's moon landing stands as an iconic, inspirational moment of those times. Space exploration shifted our tech sector into overdrive and gave us insights and solutions for our environmental challenges. The payback has been huge. America can afford to have a future. America can afford to have a future. The whole world can afford to have a future. And we need to get that message out there and be talking about the positive aspects of the, the future on a daily basis. And, and I charge you all uh, with doing that because you're the informed people, the people that really know what's going on. Uh, you know a lot more than the reporters at, uh, at most of the news agencies that are picking up sound bites that, that are exciting. Um, when we talk about... Uh, rational economic policy supporting entrepreneurship. I wanna go back to that last point on my bullet points about infrastructure and education. So you've got some objective you wanna achieve. Hopefully for most governments, that's uplift the economic standing of everybody uh, in their country. Uh, you know, Try to create a, a little more economic uh, equality, try to create better jobs, right? And so you do that, you look and you've got industry leaders in some sectors. So for instance, in the space sector, uh, you know, we've got SpaceX, ULA, Boeing, Lockheed, uh, Northrop Grumman, uh, Virgin, et cetera, right? And they have a supply chain, right? And if any one of these companies isn't doing what you think is the most efficient thing, that's okay. They are supporting the supply chain and making sure there's enough aluminum in raw carbon fiber composites and that there are people being trained in the labs at the University of Southern California where I taught before or at Arizona State University where I taught now uh, to build the components that you need to, to build rocket satellites and the other things that, uh, that make everything we wanna do tick, right? And because that supply chain exists, then it allows rising stars companies that are less well known to the general public uh, and that are popping up today that even I haven't heard about yet uh, to, to do this, right? So this is how Rocket Lab, Relativity Space, ABL and Spin Launch uh, companies in the, the SoCal uh, um, in the Space Hub are, are managing to do uh, incredible things today because this infrastructure and supply chain and human resource base and educational base exists, right? You've got to have all that uh, uh, at the bottom to support. And again, uh, even if a program never delivers anything, it still delivers on these items. We are not launching fast payloads of cash into space. Um, share the message. Uh, one of the things I, I strongly recommend is, is go buy some great books like these three. Uh, there are so many more, uh, but uh, I particularly loved uh, the entrepreneurial spirit of all three of these and the very practical and well-informed uh, 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 presentation by the authors. Um, anything Rod Pyle writes is, uh, is worth reading. Uh, of course, the same with, uh, with Dr. Zubrin. So buy these, hand them out to your friends, okay? Uh, educate the thoughtful moderates that you can reach on the topic. Um, don't bother fighting the crazy negativist, but engage them in be the adult in the room, okay? Be, be the person on the left, not the person on the right, uh, visually, right? Be the person that is presenting facts and solutions, not saying it's the end of the world, put a paper bag over your head and uh, we're doomed, right? Uh, also realize competition is powerful and good. We want more than one solution. We have to have more than one solution. Hopefully the space shuttle taught us that, right? If we didn't have the, the Soyuz, uh, bless its ancient heart, uh, when the uh, Columbia failed, you know, we would have had to abandon the, the International Space Station if we didn't have SpaceX and um, the backup uh, Antares Cygnus system delivering 
uh, cargo to the space station, we might have had to abandon the space station when we had failures there on the Russian progress module. And then both of the, uh, uh, the cargo resupply vendors suffered problems. It's okay, competition is a great thing. Aren't we glad we had two vendors and commercial crew? Because if that had been down selected in, say, 2016, and I know some people want to do that, I suspect they would have down selected to the vehicle that isn't ready yet, right? And so it's good that we have both, and we want both to succeed. Uh, we want both of these guys. Uh, they're brilliant, they're hardworking, uh, they're great Americans, they're good human beings. Uh, let us be careful uh, when we trot on anybody's toes. And guess what? National competition is good. If it wasn't for the Cold War, uh, and you know, thank gosh it didn't manifest into anything uh, you know, particularly bloody, we wouldn't have gotten at all where we are now. We wouldn't be having a Mars Society conference, I don't think, because we would have never gotten to the moon and inspired myself and a whole generation of people who are probably sitting in this room to, uh, to be in love with space. It's so important. And to that point, guess what? Competition between the US and China is a good thing. We would achieve much, much less if we combined and worked with and cooperated with the Chinese to do a single unified solution like we did with ISS, right? Uh, we got more done when we were competing with the Russians than when we were working with them. And that isn't to say that wasn't a beautiful relationship and so many astronauts and cosmonauts uh, worked so well together. Uh, but guess what? It didn't stop the Putin regime from uh, going ever, ever, ever and more farther to the fascist right uh, politically. And it did not deliver it all the technological progress that we got out of those years of, of fierce competition. So it's good. It's good if we compete and if there happens to be a group in the Artemis Accords and a, a Russian, Chinese, North Korean, Iranian uh, moon base, uh, I think that that is probably an excellent future. Uh, we'll get things done. Um, this is a quote from an article that I wrote a while back. I'd love it if you shared my articles also. Uh, you'll find a lot of them in foreign policy. A future that concentrates on managing the apocalypse without offering the potential for something better is no future at all. Uh, I also wrote an article recently on the space billionaires themselves. And I said, you know, not all of us appreciate uh, egos like Branson, Bezos, or Musk, uh, but their bigger than life personalities are taking us to places that no one has been before, even the most egotistical men. <laughs> their vision of space is central to the fourth industrial revolution. And this promises to make the returns for the internet boom look teeny uh, as far as what we're gonna do to make make our planet a better place. Uh, so you know what? Uh, some people are gonna have some fun along the way, uh, including me. That's a good thing. Uh, we should not feel guilty. We're let these folks who uh, are so manifest about the, the, the disaster that's coming make us feel guilty when we're having a good time seeing the success of our industry. Uh, educate new leaders. Uh, I gotta quickly plug what I'm doing with Thunderbird School of Global Management, launching an executive program in, uh, space education uh, to educate a new uh, generation of, of space leaders. Uh, you can go to thunderbird.asu.edu to learn more. We've got an incredible faculty there. We've just added uh, Kevin O'Connell from the Office of Space Commerce and Dr. Namatra Goswami. Uh, couldn't be better. Um, I'd like to take some questions. Uh, again, you can find me on foreign policy. I write a lot in space news, Forbes. Please pull out your phone right now and, and follow me on Twitter. Noted as Greg W. Autry. Uh, there is another Greg Autry who even looks a little bit like me. Uh, he is uh, not in the same business I am, uh, but uh, please, please do and, and find me on LinkedIn. Love to connect with you. Questions? Let me see what's in the Q&A. Thanks, Greg. Handing over for Q&A. Uh, Lara, are you taking this one? Absolutely. Um, I can do that or Greg, if um, if you're willing to look at them, that would also be great, but I can also read some of them a lot. Yeah, if you seem some that you think you want to uh, point out, throw them at me now. Um, let's see. Well, the first one from Dusty, I think it's about this duality, like we talked about fixing the earth versus going to space, that it doesn't necessarily have to be one or the other, that it's more about things about both of these directions kind of even complementing each other. So their question is, what are some of the Earth benefiting innovations you imagine will uh, we will make from Mars? So something that's going into one direction about the space, but it still can benefit the Earth. You know, that is a great question. And, and, and the, the best answer to it is, I don't have an idea or I'd be patenting it right now. Um, 
But anytime you solve a big engineering problem uh, and you go into a, a fierce competition uh, based on science and engineering, you're going to have incredible positive externalities. So nobody expected that the space program would give us the internet and the global positioning system, which, by the way, is probably the biggest carbon reducing technology we have, making all transportation 15% more efficient. Uh, it made solar power a practical thing. Uh, and NASA was the first group really to put solar panels on the ground and, and, and power communities here on Earth. Um, nobody expected those things. Nobody thought World War II would give us the microwave oven and jet transportation, right? But these things happen. So, you know, I don't know. I do think there's going to be huge developments in pharmaceuticals and biology because that's going to have to be done, right? You can transport some things to Mars very expensive, but people are going to need their maintenance meds. Uh, and so we're going to have to find a way to do, do pharma printing, essentially, uh, on a small scale. So that's one of the things I think that will come out of this. And I don't doubt when people apply themselves to it, they will. And to do automated uh, medical technologies and surgeries and such uh, over highly latent communications, uh, I think that uh, there'll be a, a lot of great developments there on, on the med tech side. Uh, on the ECLIS side, uh, you know, making environmental control systems that will have applications here on Earth is important. And understanding more about possible climates, right? Uh, why is Mars the way it is? How do you change it? We'll teach us so much about our own climate. Thank you. Um, another question. Um, I think this is an interesting one about when competition can go too far. So the uh, Nina is asking, do we need um, ethics of space explorations? <sighs> Well, yes, we do, uh, right? Uh, and I care about that a lot. So we are at a tipping point, which is very similar to uh, the age of exploration, the, the 15th and 16th century, um, when a lot of European countries went out and, uh, and colonized the world and China made the ill-fated decision to cancel their large exploration programs and did not do that. Uh, the outcomes for that had huge political, economic, cultural, and, and social manifestations that last until this day. So it makes a real difference about whether your country was colonized by, by the Spanish or, or by the British, whether you received, uh, you know, the Scottish Enlightenment and, uh, uh, and the British legal system, or whether you, you know, started out with the Inquisition, uh, and you know how much slavery was allowed uh, in that culture, and all big differences. Luckily, space has, uh, in our domain at least, no sentient uh, beings whose rights are going to be violated. So that makes the situation similar. We just had a talk on planetary protection. We need to. Uh, be realistic about the ethics of that. But the ethics are important about how we're going to treat our fellow human beings in space. And that's why I think it's so important that the United States, Britain, Japan, and free democratic nations take the lead into space because I want to carry those values of the Enlightenment uh, uh, and respect for the individual freedom of religion, freedom of speech to space. I do not want to carry authoritarian regimes to space. And I think we need to have an honest uh, talk about that. Not all governmental systems are, uh, are equal. That, that, that's a load of dingo kidneys. Thank you for the answer. And I guess we have a one minute for uh, the last question. Um, so Eric um, is asking, um, why not to turn um, it around? And it being the, the statement about fixing things in Earth, saying that we should argue that to fix the Earth, we need to develop these technologies and open up the resources of the solar system for human expansion to relieve the pressure on Earth. You're hired, Eric. Uh, there we go. Yeah. So if you read my articles, that's where I'm going. I just mentioned the technologies that we have. And, you know, frankly, we wouldn't know squat hardly about climate change if it wasn't for data from NASA satellites and overflights looking at the ocean, looking at the atmospheric content, looking at the ice caps. If it wasn't for all the NOAA buoys at sea, which all communicate via satellite uh, data on, on sea temperature changes, uh, we wouldn't uh, have the GPS constellations, which provide signal occultation, uh, which allows us to learn a lot more about the changing atmospheric composition. Uh, if we couldn't look and see what happened to Venus and what happened to Mars, planets very, very similar to ours, and, and try to figure out why they took drastically different climate uh, paths, uh, we would probably be in a much less informed position now and in the future. So yeah, we absolutely need to, to talk up the solutions and the data. And it is just absurd uh, that uh, the, the Prince or, or Greta or Bernie or anybody would stand up and say that, that space is not compatible with the environment. It is, in essence, the environment. And uh, the whole environmental movement came out of that 1960s photo that uh, Anders took of, of the Earth rising uh, uh, over the moon. Everybody looked at that and saw that, that, that small 
vulnerable blue marble and and realized you know we had to protect it it, it changed our perspective and, and that's really why the environmental movement took off so i wish i could go on thank you so much thanks greg we're out of time but it was delightful to have you here today hope you can join us again next year <laughs> absolutely in person i hope but in any case yes. be there <laughs> thanks